Good evening to all of you. Thank you so much for making it out here, especially on a Friday evening. Um, I apologize, this isn't a dance party, but, uh, <laughs> but I hope that it's gonna be an interesting conversation for, for all of you. Um, let me introduce myself first. I'm Jose Del Real. I'm a national correspondent with the New York Times. And although I'm based in Los Angeles, I actually travel all across the state, um, really up and down the state, um, you know, either responding to breaking news or writing features about life here in California with uh, a particular emphasis on making sure that some of the disadvantaged communities um, in the state that are not often enough written about in the pages of the New York Times or other newspapers are well covered and it is really important for me um, to let you guys know that uh, the New York Times is not just writing about California we are here in California we live in California we have 30 something reporters based here throughout the state uh, five or six in SoCal alone and so I, I do want to encourage all of you guys to um, see our work very much as a collaboration between our journalists and the communities that we're writing about and writing for. So now that that spiel is over, um, I also want to uh, introduce you to Azam Ahmed, my esteemed colleague from the Mexico City Bureau. If you have followed his work, you know that he is a phenomenal reporter and just truly a lovely, lovely writer. And we are so excited to be here with you today to talk about his work, to talk about his observations, and not just to get mired in the details of the immigration debate, but to really give you a window and some insights into our processes as journalists, how we identify stories that are worth telling, how we work with the communities and the sources that we're writing about to develop those stories, and what sorts of things we're thinking about as we're doing our reporting. Azam has uh, had a very long career working in conflict zones and in other sensitive areas. His stories have spanned from uh, hurricanes in the Caribbean to um, gang conflict in El Salvador to a road trip across the US-Mexico border. He writes with such a sense of place, and um, so we're going to try to unpack that a little bit uh, tonight. So yeah. With that uh, being said, um, let's talk about that road trip, actually. That, that's probably a good place to start. Yeah, um, I would meet this guy you're talking about. <laughs> which, which editor made you do the road yeah. trip? I, actually, it was a, it was a pitch. Um, so this year, I've been working on one specific project that is pretty focused. And I think we'll probably get into that later. But Towards the beginning of the year, editors were like, hey, look, there's so much happening on the border. What are we going to do on the border? And for a long time, I thought, what would it feel like to just drive the whole thing in one trip? How would, how would one's perception of the border, how would one's thinking about what the border is change? It's its own sort of band of the United States. You know, People talk about the South, the Northeast, the West. The border is its own region. And I think it's, it's not just on the US side. I think there's a shared sort of sensibility across that national line. And, uh, and so yeah, I was like, OK, if this is it, if we got to do this, let's do it. Like, I don't want to do some incremental thing where I show up in one city and do a couple of stories and satiate the editors and then head back to Mexico City and go back to doing what I was doing. If we're going to do something on the border, I want to do something, I don't know, that interests me, maybe, that, that shows sort of the the intellectual transformation maybe one has when they spend a significant amount of time and see spatially how different it is, right? When you go from Matamoros and Brownsville all the way over to Tijuana, San Diego, what's that feel like? You know, what sort of, what things occur to you that maybe wouldn't have occurred to you if you'd just been in one place? And were you driving that entire, oh yeah, the entire length? Just me. Wow. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of, it was a lot of, a lot of miles. A lot of podcasts, I bet. <laughs> Were you surprised by anything that you found? Uh, was there anything you weren't expecting during this trip? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. Was there anything I didn't expect? You know, I, I'd spent a lot of time covering the border. Mm -hmm. um, by no means do I compare myself to actual border reporters, people who spend all their time on the border and really know this region and have spent years just you know, living here and covering it. But I think, I think the... Uh, the echoes of the voices surprised me. Mm -hmm. All along, there's a very different perspective that people who live along the border 
have. And I've noticed this in other borders. If you go to the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, or Afghanistan and Iran, or any border in the world, border people are just different. They have a different perspective about their neighbor from, say, the people in Washington, where the border becomes a political issue. Here it was far less a political issue. It was a daily life issue. It was people come here, we go there. There's commerce, there's trade, there's you know kids from the Mexico side come to school on the US side. I think it was the, I wasn't expecting as much uniformity in voices. Mm. I found myself looking for people to talk about the border as a crisis. Trying to find people who lived along the border who would tell me, you know, because we, we often are accused of carrying some leftist agenda, like we're only trying to talk about things that contradict the president, but that actually wasn't at all what I was trying to do. I really wanted to hear voices. I really wanted to see what people had to say. And I found myself struggling to find people who had this hard line sort of, we can't, you know, we got to strengthen the border. And when I did, I actually spent more time talking to those people than I did people who were sort of anti-wall or more pro-migration because I wanted to hear it. So I think if the, the thing that maybe most surprised me was the uniformity of the voices. Right. Uh, you know, I know from my own experience reporting on the border that the region is so bicultural. I mean, the whole 2,000 mile stretch is so bicultural, so bilingual totally. in, in ways that, uh, you know, readers who maybe are never going to visit the border don't fully understand. And it is so incumbent upon reporters to write with a sense of place and with a sense of culture. And I think your work does a beautiful job of that. Is that intentional? Is it inevitable? How do you sort of imbue your stories with this really dynamic sense of the location that you're writing about? Because it is something I've noticed in your work. Thank you. I, I mean, I, it's certainly intentional. I think, uh, I think it's something as a foreign correspondent you, you learn to do, or you have to do in some ways. Look, there are foreign correspondents who don't do it, and they focus on certain kinds of things. But for me, a sense of place, a sense of context is important. Because if we want to talk about a place, if we want to talk about a context, why are we, what's, what's distinct about this region? What's distinct about this place? We can't do that unless we give people a sense of what it feels like, what it smells like, what it looks like. Beyond that, it's also, I think, readers like that more mm -hmm. than just kind of an aggregation of facts. I think it's really important to make readers feel like they're invested in something. Right. You know, what it, what it, you know, what it looks like. We've been, you know, obviously experimenting. For those of you who listen to The Daily or who, uh, you know, have followed the rise of photography as a sort of standalone medium in the news, you'll see that there is a transition in journalism that is happening um, with the intent of bringing people to these places that we are so privileged to cover. And um, I, I want to play a few clips, actually, from some of the reporting that you did. Um, but before I do that, can you describe um, the multimedia element to this, uh, this road trip of sorts that you took across the border? Um, yeah, just. Yeah, so I mean, the, the genesis of something like this starts with like me saying, why don't, we just, why don't we just drive the whole border? You know, why don't we see what it feels like, what it looks like, write dispatches along it. And in the process of doing that, I recognize as much as my words, photographs were going to matter. Because to me, I'd seen various parts of the border and I was just blown away by how beautiful they are. You know, these, these sort of shared spaces that are, that are really geographically staggering. And so it started off with this idea of, OK, let's make it very visual forward. Let's make sure we have one of the best photographers in the world on this story. We're going to travel together. It's someone I'd worked with in a bunch of different countries. So she and I knew each other quite well, and we worked well together. And then it just sort of expanded. It became an entire kind of dedicated website where people could go and the visual layout of it itself became appealing. And I had, I'd, I'd, I don't know if you guys know the podcast, The Daily. Um, How many of you listen to The Daily? Can you raise your hands? All right. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So one of the producers from The Daily, this brilliant radio producer reached out and we were talking about a different story and I told her, well, you know, I'm going to be driving the border for the next month so I can't do anything. She said, wait, wait, what? You're driving the border? I was like, yeah. She's like, well, can I come? And I was like, I, I think so. <laughs> Hung up and she called me back 30 minutes later. She's like, okay, I booked my flight. I'll see you in Brownsville. I was like, well, all right. Um, but she was a total delight. So it was, 
it was the three of us kind of taking this trip, everybody with both the same goal and distinct sort of ways of reaching it. And so it, it wound up being a multimedia thing because in some ways because of relationships, but also because our audiences ingest the New York Times mm -hmm. in different ways now. And so for those of you who, who do listen to The Daily regularly, this might be familiar, but I want to play um, some audio from the podcast. Um, this is about a Nicaraguan woman who I believe you met camped out under a bridge near yeah. the border. Mm -hmm. um, if you, well, let, let's listen to the clip first, um, and then maybe you can give us some context for it. Uh, Yo quiero decir que si nosotros estamos aquí y en las condiciones que estamos aquí es porque queremos hacer las cosas bien. She said, listen, I'm here with my son in these sorts of conditions because I want to do it the right way. I don't want to violate the laws of the United States. I have respect for the United States. That's where I want to go. Por todo el respeto que tenemos al gobierno, respeto también a nuestro... Look at the conditions we're in and what we're willing to suffer just so we don't violate those laws. We're not the people you guys are scared of. We're not the people... <laughs> who are going to do things in the United States that don't make our countries proud. Look, we're, we're trying to do it the right way. We are putting up with inhumane conditions, total uncertainty, and a deep-seated fear of being sent back to our country in order to do it the right way. Hay muchos delincuentes allá afuera, de otra forma violentan y le faltan el respeto a Estados Unidos. Nosotros aquí no. And it struck me that in doing it the right way, she'd sort of been pushed to this limit. There's no benefit to following the rules, is kind of what she was saying. And so the reason I wanted to play this clip is because so much of the journalism that is produced around the immigration debate is written out of Washington and is written with a policy focus. And something that Azam has done in his work is uh, you know, help bring human stories to life to show the way in which public policy shapes lives in a very tangible way. And Azam, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about you know, why it is important that we are on the ground, um, whether you could, uh, you know, I suspect I know what you think about this, but whether a whole story like this can be told from Washington and you know, why it is that we dedicate so many resources to being on the ground. No, I mean, of course not, right? We, if we want to understand the implications of what we do in Washington, we have to go where those implications land. The people who are living that experience, the people who actually have to make decisions, real life decisions. I, I often talk about the awesomeness of the decision to leave your home. I mean, you can go to Honduras and look for an American. You look at it and you're like, man, this is kind of, you know, there's not great plumbing, there's not this. There, people love their homes. No matter what we think of it, no matter what context we bring to it, people don't just leave home lightly. And so I think it's incumbent on us, especially those of us posted abroad, and Jose has done this as well, is to talk to the actual people affected by it. Because otherwise you get one version, or you get two half versions. You get right. a left version, which is also not predicated on real voices, and you get a right version, which is definitely not predicated on real voices. And so for us, what we hope we bring to the conversation is almost we serve as intermediaries, people who can take those voices, apply them with a sense of context, and you know, diffuse them to the broader population making decisions, or at least supporting candidates that make decisions. This makes me want to ask you about the role of empathy in journalism. You know, uh, for those of you who are reporters or no reporters, the question of the benefits of empathy in reporting and the limits of it in reporting and how much is too much, how little is too little, is something that reporters, particularly working in communities like, uh, like on the borderlands, um, grapple with regularly. And I'm, I'm curious where you fall on that. Do you think, do, do you write empathetically? Do you see the world empathetically? And is there a point at which that is bad for journalism? I think, um, yeah, I mean, I am 100% an empathy reporter. And it doesn't matter what the population is. I, early in my career, I covered Wall Street. And I remember talking to one of my friends about covering Wall Street, because on the front end, I was like, God, I just, I just don't care about these guys. <laughs> I don't have friends who went to work on Wall Street. I don't want to work on Wall Street. 
They make a ton of money, good for them, but I don't give a, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and my friend told me, and this is, a, this is a guy who didn't come for money, who'd actually spent time in prison. And he was like, listen, if you're gonna spend time in any community and your job is to understand that community, you have to show the same amount of understanding and empathy for the guy trading millions of dollars in stocks as you do for the guy selling drugs on the street. And it really affected me because I didn't think that would come from him. And I realized, yeah, it's important. So when I say empathy, I don't mean just like the dispossessed. I mean for whomever it is you're talking to. And empathy also isn't just carrying whatever it is they say or their story. It's also trying to understand what they're saying, what their motivations are, and applying that in, in the given context of their world. So yeah, I mean, so, so much of what I do, I hope, comes across as empathetic because I do care. I care about these issues. I care about these people, and I don't think I don't think just because they, in, in particular migrants, are asking for something of this nation that puts them in a position of inferiority. Something you just said is really interesting too because it, it shows that by contextualizing and trying to understand the perspectives of these migrants, um, sure, it's empathetic, but there's also a healthy dose of skepticism. This is an important part of journalism as well. And I actually think that this is a good moment to play a second audio clip that we have uh, teed up for you guys. Um, if you guys could hit it. Audio team. My wife, my two daughters, and one boy. One of the guys I focused in on had a wife and children in North Carolina. He'd been working there for 15 years as an electrician. 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 Yeah. And how did they get you? What charges? I asked him, you know, what, how did they catch you, essentially? I don't have a license. That's the only charge yeah. you have. You don't have any other criminal record? It's almost always for driving without a proper license. Most of these guys were deported yesterday. Maybe go back soon to the USA. He say immigration, he say, maybe I gotta go get a lawyer. And the lawyer, he go take my charges off. And, and most of them talked about maybe hiring a lawyer or something else. And I kind of just asked the guy, well, what if that doesn't work? What if there is no way to get across legally? What are you going to do? ¿Qué, qué vas a hacer si no, no te permiten? And he looked at me and sort of offered this wry smile and said, well, we're Mexicans. We've been crossing legally forever. I'll just cross however I can. <laughs> And so in this clip, right, this is a, a, a man who is telling you all about his life. He has uh, a story that I think most of us would uh, agree is, is very difficult, uh, separated from his family, trying to figure out how to get back in. But at the same time, he acknowledges that he, he will try to cross illegally if he can't do it the right way. And you know, especially in audio, it's so powerful to hear him deliver this truth sort of unabridged and to be very honest about you know, knowing the, the, the extent to which he is willing to break the law. And I'm, I'm curious how, when you're talking to sources, um, when you're you know, getting people to open up about their lives to you, what sense of responsibility do you have for, um, for explaining to them what it means to talk to the New York Times? You, you know what I mean? It, I mean, yeah. we're clearly a, a giant publication. Um, we, our stories depend on the honesty and the willingness to share of, of our sources. But there is a downside that might come along with that. How do you navigate that? Yeah, it's, 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 such a, it's such a relevant question for, I mean, this is sort of inside the journalistic process, right? <clears throat> for, for a lot of us, you ask someone, you say, can I use your name? Can I do, you run all the traps of what responsible journalism is. And then there's this other thing where sometimes they see them, their pictures on the front page or they see their voices amplified and they're like, holy shit. Right. I didn't think that was gonna be what it was. That freaks me out. I'm now in danger. I mean, this, this is something that I've been thinking a lot about recently because I'm going into, so the, the project I'm doing this year is on the homicide crisis in Latin America. I'm trying to understand what's behind it, why it's so bad. And I'm going into seven, eight different countries to try and find very distinct, specific stories. So we had a story recently out of Honduras from one community where the young men in that community used to be gang members. 
They decided they didn't want to be gang members anymore. But as a result of their decision, the gang members around them started to attack them, so they had no choice but to defend themselves. So ultimately, in electing not to be a part of a gang, they for, were forced to form a gang. And in dealing with them, I, I mean, I talked to them at length about what it meant that I was there, what it meant that there was a photographer with me. And the story, mm -hmm. excuse me, the story came out, and I think a lot of them were just staggered at like the attention, and it scared them. And so, yeah, it's, it's something I think about a lot, because it's not as simple as just, oh, this is a casual interview that will show up on a podcast that 5,000 people to listen to. The Daily has millions of subscribers. Right, right. And actually, um, I want to jump ahead in my notes, because I, I did want to talk about that piece in particular at greater length. Um, for those of you who, who um, who haven't read it yet, I highly encourage you to. It ran on the front page two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, a, a true feat of, of reporting. It gives you great insight into the situation in both Honduras and also in, in greater Central America. Um, I, I really cannot recommend it enough. Um, I would love to, if we can maybe zoom out a little bit, or sorry, zoom in a little bit and talk about craft and, and the process of reporting a piece like that. Um, you know, I'm curious. How did you get, how did you know that you wanted to write about that topic, and how did you find this neighborhood among so many, I imagine? Sure. Um, so I was, in, I was in San Pedro Sula, which is one of the more violent cities in Honduras, which obviously is where a lot of these caravans are coming from. And I was there to look at like, what, what, what the origin of the caravan was, like why did it start? And it turned out I wound up finishing that story faster than I thought. So I called my editor and said, well, look, I'm down here. Why don't I start looking for something for the violence project, the homicide project? And he was like, sure, just you know, figure it out. Go, go around, talk to people. And, uh, and I knew certain stories. I mean, the overall, overall architecture of the series is how does one write about why homicides, so I'll give you one statistic, and this is sort of the, the guiding light of the whole series. Since the turn of the century, more people have been murdered in seven countries in Latin America than every single major war zone in the world in the same time. Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Democratic Republic of Congo, think about that. Seven countries. It is so deadly, it outstrips the war zones we all see on the front page and recognize as war zones. Yet we can't quite call them war zones, so what do we call them? How do we talk about it? How do we draw attention to that? One of my friends in the audience, David Shirk, has been trying to draw attention to that for years in Mexico, and it's very, it's hard to make people realize, oh, it's not just a narco thing. There's a, there's a humanitarian crisis. And so in doing that, I was like, okay, let me look at all the academic literature, everything I can read, and find specific elements that explain this. And then I'm going to have to sync those up with specific countries because you can't just write about everything everywhere. It's boring, it's not narratively interesting, it becomes a white paper. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna focus on femicide in Guatemala because femicide's a big issue and Guatemala is one of the places where it really, there's a profound problem. Impunity in Mexico because the fact that 95% of homicides go unsolved. And yet to set the stage for this project, as I was talking to my editor, we wanted to talk about how inescapable the violence is. People who are both the victims of and participants in this violence are often completely trapped. They're not, there's not a lot of options for them. People say, well, just move. But how do you move when you're not financially capable of moving? And so while I, I knew I was looking for a story about entrapment, like the sense of like being encircled by violence, the, the ultra limited options that people living in these circumstances face. So I met with a local reporter in San Pedro Sula, great guy, he's a local TV reporter who really, really gets out into the communities. And I kind of explained to him in this abstract way what I was looking for. And I'd known about this one group in San Pedro Sula where essentially they had become a gang of some sort because MS-13, which is one of the large gangs in Central America, and the 18th Street Gang, which is the other major gang in Central America, were surrounding them. So rather than join either side, they became another gang. And he sort of laughed, and he was like, yeah, I would love to take you there, but I can't take you there. And I was like, why? He was like, well, Gordon Ramsay screwed it up for us. I was like, <laughs> Gordon Ramsay? I mean, like the celebrity chef? And like, yeah, that guy. I was like, what, what the fuck is Gordon Ramsay doing in San Pedro Sula? Now did he screw this up? And he's like, well, he 
he had a friend who died from a cocaine overdose, and he wanted to do a documentary on San Pedro Sula, so he went to this neighborhood. I introduced him to this gang, and they sort of showed him kind of how they worked and how they did, you know, process their drugs and sold them. And then he sort of swore that the documentary would never circulate in Honduras and show faces and names, et cetera. And then it did. And so basically the police had this like, you know, point by point map on who to go after and where to go after them. So we couldn't go there. And, uh, and so I was like, well, what about somewhere else? What about like, and I remember I worked in Afghanistan for three years and every so often you would see a community rise up as a self-defense group. One of these communities say, you know what, enough, we don't want the Taliban here. We're gonna fight them off ourselves. And I thought, well, you know, what's the difference? There's not an ideological component to the gangs, but if you're living under this constant threat, why wouldn't you take up arms against them? And he was like, ah, actually, there is a place you should go. And he mentioned this one particular neighborhood. And he didn't know all of the details. He kind of knew the generics. He said, it's a bunch of guys who used to be in a gang who have now formed an anti-gang, a self-defense gang, because Every, like they're surrounded on all sides. And I was like, I, I want to meet these guys. I want to know, I want to talk to them. I want to hear their story. I want to make sure that it is accurate what you're saying. And then ask them if I can basically move in to the neighborhood and spend several weeks or a month just kind of seeing the world through their eyes. And uh, you know, Orland's awesome. He was like, yeah, we'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> so he drove me in and we sat down and that's, that's how the conversation started. That story is so rich in particular, from, from my vantage point at least, because it is not a sob story. It grants a, a tremendous amount of agency, or, or sorry, demonstrates a, the tremendous amount of agency that um, folks living in this city and in this neighborhood still have, even with structural cir circumstances that are fraught and difficult and most of us would scream at. And it's a sort of story that is so textured that it's only possible by spending time there. And when when you're writing scenes, and I you know I ask friends this sometimes too. It's not always immediately clear to readers who don't know the process of journalism that like anything you're writing about you witnessed, you were there for. And so I'd love um, if you could elaborate a little bit on what your time was like essentially living alongside members of this community and whether you yourself ever felt at risk and if so, why you stayed to tell that story. Yeah, I mean, that was, so living in Mexico, I see a lot of, and I'm not criticizing Washington coverage because I think it's essential, but I see a lot of coverage that is from a distance. It's the boilerplate language that says, escaping violence and poverty. I'm sure you've all read it you know, economic hardship and extraordinarily violent circumstances of the gangs. And it becomes so impersonal, becomes so distant, becomes this thing that like I would doubt anybody in this crowd has ever actually felt personally. And if you have, then you know how insufficient boilerplate language is to really describe what it feels like. And so, I, I mean, I did this in Afghanistan as well. Like I believe in investing, going all the way in spending time there, seeing it, again, smelling it, feeling it, knowing, knowing it intimately. And so, and so yeah, it, it basically, I, I figured out a place where I could stay inside this community. You know, a, the photographer, Tyler Hicks, was with me. And, uh, and every single thing we reported, we saw. And it was about just kind of being there. You're there 24 hours a day. So at midnight when this one of the main characters in the story is a pastor and this pastor is the only person in all of San Pedro Sula who's trying to save these guys because it's inevitable they're going to die in fact by the time the story ended by the time I left one of the guys had died he'd been killed by one of the rival gangs and this guy this pastor was the only man trying to do something putting his life at risk on behalf of others and so he became in just this deeply captivating character for me, this agent of, of change. You know, he's a flawed man, he's got his problems, but he, try, he was trying, he, was, he gave a shit, which to me deeply mattered because the government certainly didn't. I, I had conversations with the police, they had no idea what the dynamics of the neighborhood were, and they were responsible for creating security in that neighborhood. And so I ultimately, like a few days in, I realized the pastor was my vehicle, he was this character, and so 
I mean, I rode with him in his car when we drove straight into MS-13 character, excuse me, MS-13 territory to beg for the lives of the guys that, you know, I was writing about. I mean, literally, it was, the violence was escalating to the point where, like, when I showed up, there was a shootout, and we knew it was MS-13 that was coming after them. The next day, one of the main people's houses was raided. You know, gunmen came in, took stuff, basically threatened this woman who was kind of a, almost like a mother to a lot of these, mem these, these young men, many of whom came from broken families. The third day, they were coming in and kicking people out of houses, and the pastor just realized, if I don't do something right now, someone's going to die. And so I jumped in the car with him when he went directly into MS-13 territory to beg for the lives of these people. And it was this incredibly, I mean, I'd never been in a situation like that. But I had, you know, I'd covered war, I'd covered other things like that, and I trusted the pastor, and I trusted the agency he had in that community, because as a religious leader, he was respected. Even the most hardened criminals recognize there's a certain escalation if you're killing a man of the cloth. But, you know, whatever access I got, I got because this pastor was a, was a maniac <laughs> and was like willing to do this stuff. And I was like, all right, man, I'm with you. Those of you in the audience, I, I mean, even if you read the story the first time around, I'd really encourage you to go back and just think line by line about the scenes that are being described. These are not, you know, reconstructed scenes told secondhand. These are, are witnessed. And uh, if I'm hung up on this story, it's because, it, I mean, it's, it's so rich and so incredibly Thank you. reported. Um, but I am curious, how how are you encountered in a setting like that as an American? Because you're clearly an outsider in this community. It's a small enough community that they would theoretically you know, know probably most of the people in it. How do you get the pastor to let you jump in the car with him? Um, I mean, this is a, even in that circumstance, it's a relationship game. You build trust. You try to demonstrate your goodwill. Speaking Spanish is essential, right? Nobody there speaks English. If you have a translator, it just it wouldn't work. You wouldn't have that intimacy. You couldn't laugh together. And the pastor and I laughed a lot together, even in horrible circumstances. The one thing we had was like similarly dark senses of humor. Right. Um, and then I think you just you explain what you're doing. And what I was doing, I didn't have to. There was no misdirection or misleading people. I was saying, look, I re I really want to show our readers what it feels like here, what it looks like, what you're up against. You know, we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars in these regions, and now we're spending far less. But what does that buy us? What does that amount to? Why are people leaving? And why aren't you guys leaving? Because none of these guys wanted to leave. Mm -hmm. They all wanted to, defect, to defend their neighborhood. And so it became, you know, I find, honestly, the, the best way is to just be really direct. Just to say, look, this is what I want to do. Right. I care. I'm here. And I think most of these guys understand and, and women understand like, well, if he's going to be here, he's not here because it's making him rich or it's making him happy. Right. Like, he's got no real, like, it's certainly not rich. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think they, I think there's a certain degree of respect. Like, okay, if you're willing to be, I, I'll, I'll give this anecdote, which isn't exactly related to the question you asked, but it, it was when it really, it really came together for me what was happening in this community. It's the first time I was sitting down with these guys and I was just inhaling their story. They were saying they didn't want to be in a gang and yet they had to be in a gang because it was the only way they could survive. And I thought, God, what drama, like what like human, what, what a peculiar and tragic human condition to, to write about. And, I, and then it occurred to me, I'm like, well, how do I know that, right? Like this is, you guys could just be telling me this. How do I know you're actually surrounded? What is it right. that, that, you know, how do you feel it? And they were like, what time is it? And I was like, oh, it's like 5.30. They were like, just wait a minute. I was like, what do you mean, just wait a minute? They said, as soon as the sun starts to set, MS-13 comes up to the edge of our neighborhood and they whistle at us. Every single night, they whistle at us just to let us know how close they are. Just to let us know they can come in with all of their guns and all of their men and slaughter us at any time. It's to keep us scared. And I was like, well, that's chilling. And then I waited 15 minutes, and when I heard the whistle, I was totally terrified. It was scarier than when they were shooting at this group, than when we were sitting down with like an MS-13 assassin. It was the scariest moment because I was like, they're just right there. They are just right there, just 
not even a stone's throw away, these guys who want to kill him and have the means to kill him and the capacity to kill him. And they're just teasing him with this whistle. So uh, I'm going to ask a few more questions, but we also want to give the audience an opportunity to, to um, get in all the questions, yell at us, do what you will. Um, and so uh, you know, as we're wrapping up this segment, I'd encourage you guys to uh, all you men and women to all think about um, different questions that you would want to ask. We have mics on each side of the stage here, um, and it'll be like a classic lineup sort of situation. So uh, just be aware that that's coming soon. Um, so yeah, just to ask, uh, you know, to start to wrap this up, it, it, the story that you just told is so powerful, and it brings together so many of the themes that run through this coverage. What has often happened in talking about the migrant crisis is we are debating whether it is a crisis or not. That's one point. And then we are also debating whether it's rooted in violence or economics. And the question has been posed almost as if it's a dichotomy. It's one or the other. And I'm just curious what your insights are on that. This is, if I may, particularly um, fashionable in DC-based reporting. And I'm just curious, with your rich experience on the ground, where you fall on this. Is there a crisis on the US-Mexico border? And if, whether there is or isn't, is what we're seeing rooted in violence or in economics? That's a great, it's a really important question, I think, because <clears throat> a lot of what we hear today from Washington is that there's a crisis, that something has to be done, and a lot of the United States believes that there is. The crisis, I mean, there's, it's, it's, it's phased in some ways. I would argue that people living in the most violent areas of Central America are, in fact, living in a crisis, which then forces them to leave or encourages them to leave. And then what happens at the border is a crisis, but it's a man-made crisis. It's a crisis of deciding to make that a crisis. We've had many, many years of much, much, much higher migration into the United States. This is not, these numbers aren't extraordinary in raw volume. They're extraordinary because of the number of children that are showing up. They're extraordinary because of the number of families that are showing up. But in terms of overall numbers, they're not extraordinary. And so then you wonder, well, why has it become a crisis? It's because policies have changed. It's because of policies that inhibit the passage of people into the United States to apply for asylum, things like that. So I think you have a genuine crisis in some of these countries, and it's a governance crisis. It's a security crisis. It's very often a corruption crisis, which feeds into governance. And then along the border, I think you have a decision to create a crisis. In the same way that a lot of times, famine worldwide is a man-made decision to create problems for countries. I believe that along the border, it's not a crisis in and of itself. It wouldn't be a crisis unless there was a decision to create that reality. Now, the, the question of security versus economics the reason that gets so polarized is because of, because of US asylum law. If it's economic, well, the bar gets a lot higher. If it's security, that's different. And what I've found, if you want a simple answer, is that m more often than not, it's economic. More often than not, people are fleeing because they have no alternative. But I also deeply believe the distinction between the two is very shameful. I think we should take into account what I mentioned before. There is a gravity to making the decision to leave your home. There's a gravity to making the decision to take your children that you think it's safer and better for them to march thousands of miles north through treacherous territories where nobody is your friend and arrive at a border where in all likelihood you're not going to get in or at the very least you're not going to be treated with dignity. That decision alone should explain the power of the economic decision. There's, n I mean, what's the difference between a gun to your child's head right now or the fact that you can't pay for them to eat? You can't afford, there was a, 
I, I spent a lot of time in San Salvador in some of these gang-controlled neighborhoods. And I remember talking to one of the guys who ran a small little chips and soda stand. And I asked him, you know, what's your business like? How is it? And he was like, man, every, every day I think about leaving. And I was like, why? He was like, well, not only because I have to pay a bribe to the gangs, not only because they force me to pay whatever it is that I'm making a percentage of it or a fixed rate to them, but I have to go. The gang that the opposing gang controls the marketplace where the goods are cheaper, which means I have to go to another neighborhood to buy goods at a more expensive price, so my margins are already paper thin. And he told me, he said, look, my, my friend who ran a little stand up the street, in the middle of the night last week, I helped him unload all this stuff and flee because he couldn't take it anymore. He wasn't making any money and he was being forced to pay a bribe. He's like, I think about that every day. My problem is I got nowhere to go. Like, if I move inside of my country, I'm going to move into another gang's area and be controlled by the economics and dynamics of that. Now, if he's being honest and he comes to the United States and he applies for asylum and they say, was your life in imminent, in imminent danger, he's got to say no. I'd submit to you guys that it was. That there's not that much of a difference between the gang member putting a gun to his head and saying, I'm going to kill you versus like, I'm going to bleed you to death slowly. So I, I, tend to, I tend to think there's a lot more significance and meaning to the economic migration than I think maybe counterparts in Washington would. Because it's never just like, oh, I can't make enough money here. It's always predicated on security. Security is, is what governs life there, whether you're in immediate danger or whether your future is compromised. And so the, the last question that I um, want to ask you about uh, before we turn it over to the audience is actually a departure from the theme of the rest of this conversation, which has ostensibly been immigration. You are responsible for covering Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean, I believe. That's a big plot of <laughs> land uh, and sea. And I know as a journalist that we have to make decisions all the time about what we have time to cover, what is the priority, and what is you know driving the news cycle. Are there any stories uh, that have been on your radar that you haven't had a chance to get to that, or, or that you believe that, or stories that you've written that you believe have not found their audience because of the emphasis on um, immigration specifically, but also perhaps some of the violence that, that you write about? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, one of the benefits I have is I've got great colleagues in Mexico who cover a lot of the, the stuff that needs to be covered regionally right. on a more regular basis while I might be doing sort of something maybe a bit more long term where I can't focus on that. But yeah, I mean, Frankly, it's you know, one of the things that I push in the Bureau, even though I don't do it as much as happy stories, even in the midst of all of this drama and terror and sadness. And I learned this in war zones. People still get married. People still love one another. People still have kids. They go play soccer on the weekends. They do all sorts of normal things. And there is a real triumph in that humanity, and I think and look, you can't write a story about like on Saturday at 3 p.m. seven people played soccer in a field, you know, west of the town center. That's not a news story, but you can find ways. You don't think they'd put that on the front? <laughs> yeah, they might not front that. <laughs> but I think it is important to, and I wish, like I, I, I have, it's just me doing what I'm doing. I mean, look, there's a lot of people doing what I'm doing. I'm saying, I'm speaking just for myself. And I made a choice over the last few years do I write the happy stories that are nice and important? Or do I go at the heart of what I think the issues are, what I think is incumbent on us? We have an international audience. We sometimes have influence, although things have become so polarized, I wonder how much we're, our, our stories are crossing the aisle. Um, and so I, I kind of just decided that OK, I'm going to live with this. I'm going to live in this world. I'm going to write stories about the disappeared in Mexico. I'm going to write about homicides in Jamaica. I'm going to write about impunity in Mexico, because to me, these are issues that, are, that require more effort, more attention, and in some ways, more, more empathy. All right, and with that, I do want to turn it over to all of you. Um, like I said, we have mics on each side. Please uh, line up. 
It is incumbent upon me as a moderator to remind everybody that questions end with a question mark. <laughs> and, um, and we're probably just going to take turns to, to keep it easiest. And I'll oh, let you take it. Um, really appreciated you coming here and sharing your experiences. I volunteer at the local shelter for asylum seekers. We process about 60 to 150, uh, fam usually families, here and get them on their way. And one of my jobs is to take them to the airport, mm. to go to various parts of the country and wait usually the two years for their asylum process to, to run through. My question is, as I've read, it takes several thousand dollars to pay these coyotes to get these people up here. Some of these folks look like they just were plucked out of the highlands of Guatemala. They sometimes only speak their native language. What's the business model for this? And it, it, it worries me because a number of these people I call the, the destinations to, to let them know that they're coming. And some of these folks don't know these people. They're sponsors. Mm. And I really don't know if anybody's following up on wh what happens to these people. Are they going, first of all, are the family members really family members? The ones who aren't, are they traffickers? What happens to these people for these two years? Are they get, getting sucked into chicken factories? What's going on? So it's sort of two related questions. I mean, the, the business model is, so if we're talking about the highlands of Guatemala, you mortgage your land or you sell it so that your child can go and you become a sharecropper. Um, or you borrow money. Sometimes the coyote, coyotes will front the money. Like, OK, this is a $12,000 trip. When you get to where you have three chances to get to where you're going, and when you get there, you owe us your paycheck until that debt is paid off, or a portion of your paycheck. It's, uh, it's usurious. Right? I mean, this is organized crime. There's not a lot of, there are not a lot of options for these folks. And so they take the market that's available to them, and that's typically sell what I have, take what I've saved, and, or go into a deep and perverse debt to make that trip. But the idea is that these people are going to be paying. They're going to be getting oh, something yeah. from them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is that being reported on? Is there, is, are yeah. there people checking where these people go and seeing actually what happens to them for this period of time? Because most of them are going to end up going back to Central America. Mm. The asylum rate is only less than 20 percent. So. No, you're, that's, a, that's a great point. I think that's, I mean, and Jose can answer that question as well. I'll, I'll say as a national correspondent, I mean, this is something that we've talked a lot about, um, how these folks are getting lost in the system. And from the journalistic perspective, it is so difficult to track people as they're you know, going the seven winds. And, a lot of times they don't want to talk to reporters. They don't want to um, compromise their pending legal cases by putting their stories in the paper. They don't want to, um, I don't know what they're telling the government, and I don't know if that's different from what they're telling us. We verify everything that, that people tell us before we publish it. And I would suspect that there is great unease that comes with being under that level of scrutiny by both reporters, particularly when there's a legal case that's pending. And so I am right with you in thinking that we need more stories precisely on this, and we're trying to figure out how to tell them. Um, but let's link up after this, because I, 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 yeah, I... Yeah, I'd love to chat. It's her to jump in. No, it's great. Uh, I personally, and I imagine most of the people here, have a lot of frustration with regard to not being able to influence the current administration. They, they don't have policies that are based on anything intelligent. They're just trying to influence their base. But that won't be for long, hopefully. In the next 18 months or so, there's, at least as of yesterday, 23 candidates who would have different uh, policies might be 24 or 25 by the day, but... Uh, I'm running. <laughs> this is actually is coming out. This is my announcement. I'm yeah. running for president. <laughs> Jose Del Real. <laughs> what sort of things should we be asking of those candidates to try to get them to commit to uh, realistic policies that would help uh, solve this crisis? I, I'm, I don't think I'm going to give you a satisfying answer. And it's not... I, I'm not doing that to be frustrating or intransigent. First off, we have to stay, we have, I have to maintain a certain independence from any sort of like, how does one influence? We go out, we find stories, we hopefully find true stories. We 
develop them, and then we publish them, and then the chips fall where they may. Some people might think they're false. Other people might think they're the best thing they've read. Um, how to influence an administration, I, I, I couldn't, I, I can't articulate the best way to, to have what your beliefs are and what the beliefs are, I, I imagine, of a lot of people here influence an administration that has a very different set of beliefs. Mm -hmm. But what I've also found is while, you know, there was this, I remember watching this interview with Newt Gingrich and it was staggering. He was talking about homicide and crime in the United States. And he says, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. It's just, it's up and everybody's scared. And the reporter's like, actually, you know, Mr. Gingrich, it's down. <laughs> like, it's been, it's been down for like the last 10 years. And he's like, well, I don't care what your statistics say. I know what I think and I know what I believe and that's what's true. And like, yeah, maybe it is. And sure, there are facts and then there's context and there's emotions and feelings and all these other things. And so, you know, I, I think I know a lot of my colleagues hand ring over impact. How can we impact the dialogue? How can we change the way people think about things? How can we, and I, I, there's no good answer to that. You have to do what you believe and go out into the world and like, you know, put your heart into it and like let the chips fall where they may because right now it's hard. It's such a polarized society that even if you do an incredibly nonpartisan, wonderful campaign of influence, Whoever's on the other side of that fact isn't going to believe you anyways. Okay, thank you. Thank you. In your uh, drive along the border, uh, I'm imagining you had some encounters with ICE. Can you uh, give us your characterization of this uh, organization of our country? I'll actually also have <laughs> ask you to talk about that as well. I, I didn't deal as much with ICE. I mean, my, my primary focus was talking to regular people on both sides of the border. I didn't want to make it an institutional project where I was talking to Border Patrol and ICE and these agencies that are in charge of sort of carrying out the current immigration policy. So in so much as I dealt with them, it was as, you know, as an American with a name like Azam Ahmed. <laughs> So there was more than once where I got stopped and pulled across for extra questioning and sort of, what are you doing here? Why, well, you know, working for the New York Times didn't really help. <laughs> <laughs> nor, did, nor did living in Mexico. So, <laughs> so my, my experience is, uh, as a reporter, as a journalist, because I, I mean, I focus on Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. So I don't, I don't spend a lot of time on the US side talking to the agencies, trying to hold them to account, although I think that's a, a job that my colleagues do wonderfully and a lot of people do in very important ways because there's a lot of questions about the things that they've done and the ways that they've acted. Um, but in terms of how they've interacted, I mean, it's interesting, the clip that, that Jose played a little while ago talking to these guys, you know, you're talking to people who have lived in America, in the United States for 15, 20, sometimes 30 years. People who, when I ask them, where are you from? They're like, North Carolina. But they say it in a very Latino accident, right. accent. Right. And it's funny, because they really, they, like their children are born there. Their wives are there. Their whole lives, every, everything about that their, their identity that they've constructed as an adult is in South Carolina, Georgia, you know, wherever they are. And they were talking to me in this, like, this deeply emotional way. They were crying in some cases about the way they'd been treated in detention the way they'd been treated like criminals, the way they'd been marginalized and sort of humiliated. It was the, the, that lack of human dignity. And these aren't people who just like, you know, were selling drugs or did something horrible and then fled to the United States. These are people who just were looking for another way to survive, looking for an opportunity. You know, not bad people, people that a lot of folks who know them would say enrich their community. So from my perspective, the, the little that I engage with ICE, it's usually the sense of people feeling deeply dehumanized by the agency. But uh, I'll say you should, you should jump in. Uh, well, it's, I mean, you know, it's a complicated question. My, to, to be blunt, my interaction with ICE as a reporter for the New York Times is one of privilege. I'm an American citizen. I 
pass is white. I don't get stopped when I cross uh, the border. And I think what I will say is that journalists have to be very mindful of how our relationships and interactions with institutions might differ from the relationships and interactions that other people have with those same institutions. And I think that part of what we certainly do on the, the national desk, and I would venture every journalist does this, every good one certainly, is to uh, make sure that we are reporting out on those interactions. I mean, really talking to the people who are engaging with these institutions rather than assuming that they are behaving any which way, be that uh, the right way or the wrong way. Um, the important thing is to make sure that our individual interactions as reporters are not um, are not making us biased in the way that we're writing one way or another. Our uh, our stories and our sense of story has to be based on what we're hearing from our sources, who are so generous with their stories. So that's what I'll add. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, have you figured out uh, what the Border Patrol is trying to, to get from the uh, reporters when they question them? Uh, what sort of information are they after? <laughs> I'll let you take this one. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I could, you know, marshal a guess or two, but to be honest, I'm not quite sure. And again, from my, from my side of it, the Mexico side of it, there was a similar thing where reporters who were covering on the caravan were being denied visas and being denied coverage or being kicked out. Um, and I think it was two things. One of them is that there was a deep sensitivity in Mexico about the caravan being covered because it made Mexico look like it wasn't doing anything and the government didn't like that. But they weren't just willy-nilly kicking people out. They were looking for people who had questionable migratory statuses as, peop as reporters, usually as Americans or Canadians, in Mexico. So it gave them license or the, the window to do it. They weren't picking, like, for instance, I never had a problem. No one in my bureau did, and we were covering it a lot as much as anyone. So I think it's two things. One, there's like a malicious intent, like we don't really like all of this coverage. It makes us look bad. But then there was a legalistic instrument that they used to do that because a number of reporters in Mexico, especially freelance reporters, often come and try and sort out their migratory status while they're in the midst of covering things. And Mexico for ages has allowed that to happen. I think they've seen that as a fine thing to do. But when the pressure was on them, I think they decided to apply the law for the first time in an adverse way. Um, as an aspiring journalist, I'd really like to know how you remain objective in your work. You know, when the president is directly attacking your culture, your ethnicity, your existence, you know, how do you keep your opinion from, like, affecting all of your writing? That's a, yeah, I mean, that's, that is one of the fundamental questions I'm sure both of us deal with. I'm a Muslim, and the Muslim ban was something that I saw as, you know, it was upsetting, personally. You know, I, my parents migrated as Muslims. Would they have been able to, under the current circumstances, probably not. Um, I think the thing that I've realized over time is, as much as you believe in one side or another side, all you really have is your independence and your independence of thought. Because there are gonna be times when you believe in someone or something or some cause, and you're gonna watch it crumble. You're gonna watch it turn into something that, oh, you know what, actually I don't believe in that. That person didn't do what I thought they were gonna do, or that cause was not as righteous as I thought it was. And I've had that myself as a young reporter. I felt like something was deeply important, you know, righteous. And then I watched it and I, and I thought later, I was like, I wish I'd just covered that straight. Not for, not against, just as honestly as I could. And genuinely tried to understand both sides. And of course, that's, that's a challenge. Right, I mean, for a lot of people in the Latino community, trying to cover Trump and understand like where is this anger coming from, where is this xenophobia coming from, is hard because it's directed at you, or it feels like it's directed at you. But there can be no sort of elevated understanding if you're not trying to at least understand where it's coming from. And so, in your mission as a journalist, if you you know, there's activists who who take that job on and they are 
and that's important. That's an important role in society. But if you want to be a journalist, don't be an activist. Be someone who is trying to, trying to understand both sides and be as centrist as possible. And that's not to say, just take whatever the other side says and transcribe it, because I don't believe in that either. But don't go into it with a grudge, even if naturally you might feel that way, because it won't make your journalism better. OK, thank you so much. The, the population of Central American countries has increased by about sixfold since 1950. A similar exponential growth in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in all the trouble spots in the world. Almost never reported as part of the story. Is that because it's not your beat to discuss the underlying causes of the economic troubles, of the unemployment, of the violence? Or is it too hot to handle, particularly since in Central America, the church itself is encouraging some of the population growth? It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I would, I would submit that there are a lot of countries who have seen that kind of growth that are not in complex situations. Um, so I would say that might be one factor. For, for sure, the youth bulge in a lot of Latin America, combined with the unemployment, has created more violent circumstances. But in lots of sub-Saharan Africa, similar things have happened, similarly in the Middle East. And not all of the Middle East is swept up in war. So I think pointing out one or two data points in a vast sort of cosmo of factors isn't really getting at what it is that's causing the violence in these places. And it's certainly a factor that I think, you're right, journalists could explore more, but it's not a defining one. Because again, the same circumstances exist elsewhere and the same violence isn't replicated. Um, I think it has, I mean, there's, there's a vast difference between conflict in Afghanistan and conflict in Central America. And I don't think population growth is the primary driver of either. Hello. Um, I'm also studying to become a journalist. And what you said about the whole empathy while writing kind of struck a chord with me, because I'm pretty empathetic. but. Uh, I was just wondering, have you noticed, like, have you come across reporters who didn't write with empathy? And uh, have you noticed them reporting differently? And also, how did you know you wanted to study journalism? I, th I think, for sure, I mean, I think most journalists go into it because the craft, the mission, appeals to them, but there's a lot of different ways to express that, right? You don't have to be empathetic necessarily to cover Wall Street. You don't have to be empathetic to necessarily cover the White House. I mean, you do in some respects, but like you're covering an institution and your job is to take what is said and what is done and try and figure out where they don't overlap. Or it's to look at inconsistencies or however you see your job. I think if, you're, if your heart is in empathy, if your heart is in giving voice to the people who don't, might not have voices, and creating sort of a reality in the news, in the mainstream news, for those, a space for them, then you gotta do that. You should, you should follow that. I mean, that's any advice I'd give to a young journalist is do not only what you're good at, but what you care about. I had, a, I had a mentor tell me once, I had these two different jobs open up at the Times. One was this very prestigious job that on paper would have been awesome. And the other was to be a war correspondent in Afghanistan years after the war had ceased to be of interest to the American public. And I thought, well, he was like, why, you know? So I was like talking to people, and people were like, why would you go be cannon fodder when you could have this other great job? Like, nobody even cares if you're in Afghanistan. And the guy asked me how old I was, and I told him, and he was like, man, just shut up. And I was like, what? <laughs> it doesn't sound like advice, you sound like an asshole. And he was like, look. Stop thinking about it in terms of what's more prestigious, what's nicer, what's cooler, what's gonna make you look better. Do what you love. Do what you care about. And what I cared about was covering war. I think it's one of the most odious things we can do as, a, as humanity. And it turned out to be the thing that sort of unlocked the rest of what I did. And it was at a time when it was not, it was not sexy to be a war correspondent. 
It was sort of like you missed the golden years of the war, if you can say that, you know, like when, when more troops were being drawn in and where more money was being spent and where it was on the front page every day. But I was able to, I mean, I cared a lot about it. I cared what was happening. And if I had gone and done that other job, I wouldn't have as much. You know, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have poured myself into it. It wouldn't have mattered as much to me. So in the same way, I would say if you know empathy is something you believe in, follow that. Don't, don't misconstrue a job covering you know, the city council necessarily as the thing that you want to do just because it's a job. You know, believe in yourself. Believe that you can, you can use your talents and skills and do the thing you want to do because you'll do it well. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, I, before I state my question, I just want to give a little background. I'm a political science major. Spanish was my minor. I spent a couple summers down south of Mexico City in Cuernavaca. I'm sure you're familiar. So I've been really frustrated at the New York Times. And since you're the two representatives here and listening and talking, I find myself feeling that same frustration. So I do have a question. And I want to make sure I understood you. At the beginning, you said you had a hard time finding people to talk to for the other side of the story, people who don't necessarily want migrants coming over. Did I understand that correctly? Because, it, and maybe it's a rhetorical question, because if, if I did, that's what I understood. I don't get it, and the New York Times and you are missing it. Trump is going to get reelected again because of this kind of attitude and this kind of coverage. You are missing the story of how many people, um, the stories behind why people voted for Trump. I'm not a Trump voter, and no universe would I ever vote for Trump. You guys are missing it. Do you get it? For sure. Just like you missed the 2016 election, just like the New York Times missed weapons of mass destruction and the Iraq war. <laughs> it's frustrating. That's a totally fair point. My so, and one more thing. So just like, even like you were talking about, you need a world-class photographer to go do this. I know this may sound nitpicky. No, you don't. You just need a decent photographer. Get some creativity, tell the story. I'd, I'd be happy to give you my email. I can connect you with people that can tell you their side of the story. I don't necessarily want a bunch of migrants. And, and my personal part of it is that we've got climate change, we've got um, ex ex species going extinct every day, every hour. I don't want a bunch more population. But talk to different people and get their stories and figure it out. I'm not saying the stories you covered aren't interesting. I like personal stories. I like knowing about all that. But it's only a part of the story. And Trump is going to win again if you guys don't get. I mean, your paper of record. So let me, yeah, let me jump in as the the national correspondent here, and as a former political reporter that covered the Trump campaign for the Washington Post in 2016. I think that your your opinion is, you know, one that I've heard from a lot of people. I spent two years on the road talking to people who did vote for President Trump, and. As my friends were asking me before the election whether uh, he could really get elected, I would emphatically tell them that uh, I really did believe that he could get elected. It was very possible, and of course, it ended up happening. Um, which is all to which is all to say that um, what you are saying to us, like I hear, and that is reflected in my reporting because I think it is a common position in the United States today. I don't know that it's the majority position in terms of raw totals, and so I would never um, state with authority one way or the other. But I do want to clarify that I think what um, Azam was trying to say earlier was that along vast stretches of the border, yeah. actually the bicultural and bilingual quality of the borderland itself um, it creates this really interesting subsection of the United States where there is a lot of uh, binationalism. I think that's all he was trying to say. Yeah, on, but on your yeah. broader point, I don't want to dismiss your broader point because I think it is important. Journalists do need to make sure that we are actually talking to a lot of different types of people and that those opinions are reflected in our coverage. I wasn't at the Times during the 2016 election, and so I am not going to speak to it. But I, I will say that uh, it is very important to me personally to make sure that our reporting um, and our uh, industry is reflecting the range of opinions in, in the United States. So that's yeah, my, my point was specifically along the border, like very close to the border. There's one congressional district that's Republican, all the others 
are not. And so along that area, I highlighted and focused on those voices for your point exactly, to show people that like, look, there are people who think differently here. What I was saying is behind the scenes, you know, every story you're interviewing dozens of people. And in that thing, I'm not sitting around like holding up a sign like, Democrats, please come talk to me about how you hate Trump. I'm looking for people. And I was surprised because I thought there'd be a lot more anti. But, but do you know how hard I looked? But in some ways, people didn't want their stories told. Maybe the people you're talking to in Honduras, there are people you're talking to that you're telling that aren't speaking up because they don't feel safe either. And you're saying there's, there's a lot. No, but one of the, one of the, the that episode, one of the major focuses was on an individual with exactly that voice who didn't want more migrants, who was frustrated at the fact that the culture and like resources were being expended. Awesome. If, I, if I might step in, I, I, I don't know that going back and forth is going to be super productive sure. uh, beyond this, um, but, I, but I will say that your point is, is well taken, and I want to use this as an opportunity to let everybody know that our email addresses are publicly available, like Google us, go to our Twitter. If you have a story idea, if you have frustrations with our coverage, we become better journalists when we hear from you guys directly, and please feel free to write to us. You've got to get more stories. I'm telling you guys that you were you are leaning one way. I, th I, I think there's I think there's like your your point is totally valid. And I know I'm gonna take a bunch of black. Really no, 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 but but that, I, I appreciate your bravery in saying that because this is a it's a crowd that maybe not maybe won't agree, and I would I would argue two things. One, it's important to hear that, and two, our job isn't to not get Trump reelected. Right. My job is not to be the opposition. And I, again, I'm not even in the United States. I live in Mexico and I cover south of Mexico. My job is to reflect those voices and those people and their experiences. And if that doesn't give air to one side or the other, I can't, I, I, I'm not in control of that. But I would argue, I think a lot of people look at the New York Times and think, oh, you know, the opposition to Trump. Trump hates them. He calls them the failing New York Times and fake news. Our job is not to to not get Trump reelected. Our job is to cover the reality. And if we're not doing a good job covering the reality, people like you should say it, as you have. I appreciate that. Absolutely. All right, and I do want to make sure that everyone gets an opportunity, so. Uh... You're good. Yes. So you write about violent gangs in foreign countries. And so my question is, are you ever concerned that um, or have you ever got close to a situation like this as a result of your reporting in the New York Times? Some of your subjects might become the potential targets or actual targets of violence. Mm. Do you ever lose any sleep over this? All the time. Interesting question. I lose sleep all the time over that. I think it's one of the reasons, I mean, especially working as a foreign correspondent, as a war correspondent, I get frustrated with all the anonymity afforded to people who just don't want to be seen saying something publicly in Washington or whatever in politics. It's like you're a fucking public official. You should speak publicly. Like you got elected for that reason. But I take it very seriously when it comes to people's lives because it does matter. You use somebody's full name, you tell people where they live and they're speaking out against some, some local threat to them and people die. I mean, that's like one of the one of the harder parts about my job, I think from Washington and from other places, it can seem theoretical. But I know if this person says this thing to this person, they're gonna get killed, because life is very cheap in certain places. So, so yeah, I take, it, I take it deeply seriously, and I lose sleep over it. As I was saying with the Honduras story, it was, it was exactly that. I was worried that like even as we'd been given permission to use names and use photos, that there's a, there's a chasm between what they think it means and what it actually means. And when it dawns on sources what it actually means to be on the front page of the New York Times or you know, on a dedicated website to one particular story, it's a very different, it's a re very different recognition. So I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think about that a lot. I think about that more than I think about almost anything is, you know, because for whatever broader purpose a piece we do may have, at the end of the day, I mean, if it's, if it's a life and death situation, I care about it a lot. I've gotten in fights about it, actually. 
with my own editors sometimes when they think I'm going too far with other journalists. I mean, I, I, I take it very seriously. Thank you. Hi. So since um, the end of December, I've been involved with uh, the Rapid Response Network shelter that um, you also had mentioned. Um, I'm one of the doctors that does uh, health screenings on the incoming asylum seekers. And the conditions that they describe in the um, ICE detention facilities sound really terrible. Um, a lot of them are kept there um, for really prolonged periods of time. They arrive hungry, dehydrated, um, and um, you know they're in very close contact with each other, a lot of colds, et cetera. And I'm just wondering if you've had the opportunity to kind of view firsthand the actual process that asylum seekers go through. Um, I'm sure it's very hard to visit the facilities, but to kind of understand what's really going on there, what happens once they are released, because um, often they aren't released safely, because it seems to me like that's more of the crisis at the border. It's this kind of humanitarian crisis and how the government is treating these people as opposed to you know the numbers of people or who are coming. So I'm just wondering if any in any of your border work, if you've experienced that or have insight into that. And you might be better. I, I, as I mentioned before, mine is secondhand from talking to migrants, yeah, on this side of the border. We've done um, a great deal of reporting on, on that very fact. I mean, I um, remember, I, I haven't been to any of the, the ICE detention facilities myself, though I believe some of my colleagues have visited. Um, I have interviewed, though, uh, migrants right after they're released from detention to await uh, their asylum proceedings here in the United States, um, some of which ended up filtered through the San Diego Rapid Response Network. And what they described to me is exactly what you said. They contract scabies or lice in these detention centers. They develop colds. They develop pneumonia. Children come out of there dehydrated. and. Yeah, that is a crisis. I think everyone agrees that that's a humanitarian crisis. And I actually think that the Trump administration would agree that that is a crisis. The question is, and this is what we try to unpack in our reporting, is what is at the core of this? Why is it happening? And um, yeah, we, I mean, we, we spend a lot of time trying to get to that question. Um, I, I'll just point you to some of the reporting I did in, I think, either December or January, uh, based here in San Diego on specifically the end of the safe release program, uh, which ended in October. Um, which basically the, was a policy that ended in which the administ which previous administrations, including the Trump administration for some time, would coordinate releases so that the migrants and their families um, could meet up in different states. They'd help coordinate travel. They would do uh, additional health screenings before releasing them, things like that. This ended in October. And what ICE told me is that they had to stop doing it because of the large surge of migrant families they were seeing left them without the, the staff capacity to continue safe release. There are a lot of people that are skeptical ab about that. Um, we certainly approach those claims with skepticism. And I would encourage you to keep following our reporting on NewYorkTimes.com. <laughs> Does that? And uh, please come find me afterwards, because I'd love to connect. And we're going to take just one or two more questions, if that's uh, being told to wrap it up. But I want to give you guys the time, for sure. I'm with an organization that's a national organization. Uh, and we have been invested in Honduras, Mexico, throughout Mexico. Our latest thing is sex workers in Tijuana, economically empowering women. Haiti, Puerto Rico, we're there. And we've been there for 13, 15 years in these countries, in Honduras way before these problems started, working primarily with indigenous women, et cetera, trying to give them a way to earn a living so they wouldn't be so impo impoverished. And But we're just one of thousands of organizations in the United States that represent the other side of America. The whole world thinks we're a little, a little unhinged about the border, but the truth is Americans have been investing in these countries for 20, 30 years 
trying to help those people help themselves. We're, that's, the, um, that's the American spirit, in my opinion. And it's just, we never hear about it. We never hear about all the people donating their time, at risk, doing site visits in these countries, in Honduras. Uh, I just wish we had that other part of America better represented. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Hi. Um, I am from the Ambos Nogales area, and I work on U.S.-Mexico um, issues, border issues. And so I feel like I have a really good understanding of the border and the life and the coexistence of the communities. But I have to say that reading these stories and tracking some of the um, the highlights that you that come towards us or at us, I I feel like we're a little bit of a at a loss in terms of trying to understand without without bringing a lot of emotion to it. Um, but I'm also curious if these stories where there's um, a clear uh, message about how hard it is to make it here now in the border, I mean, are these stories coming back to the communities where the people are coming from? And I'm just curious because you hear all kinds of um, um, just pieces of information, but I'm just wondering what it is that people in Central America, per se, are hearing and what is getting back. Because the numbers continue, right? And so I'm just curious what, what you know of what is being disseminated. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time, especially during the child separation crisis, asking you know, people from Central America, you're still coming, you know, or on the route. You, know, you find them in south, southern Mexico or even along the border, like, you're still coming. I mean, there's, there's a multitude of answers, as there are a multitude of people. Right? People have different incentives. I found one young couple, they were adorable, and they were just like, I don't know, it's like part of it's adventure, part of it's like I know what's back there and I don't like it, so I'm gonna come. For others, it's, you know, my child is in danger back there and I'll do whatever I have to do to get him out of that. For others, I'm the padre de familia and I have to support people back there and I can't do it in El Salvador, so I'm gonna go. But what I've consistently found it, is that that fear of what's to come, that fear of not being accepted, is less than the fear of what's behind. It's just a simple calculus. What, what they're leaving is always sadder than what they expect to find where they go. And I think that is the, that is the spark of migration. And so with that, uh, on that heavy note, um, uh, that's all the time we have, unfortunately. Sorry to bum you guys out. <laughs>I just want to thank you all again for being such a wonderful audience and for coming out here on a, on a Friday evening. Um, we're going to be doing events like this across the state in uh, California, public libraries. It's something that we're extraordinarily excited about. And um, hopefully, we'll be back here in San Diego soon. And I hope to see many of you again. Um, I have one last pitch to give you guys. We have a, a daily California newsletter. It's called California Today. Um, you can sign up in the back. I think we might have people signing folks up. If not, just find us online. Uh, we put a lot of work into it, and um, we really want this to be a product that you guys feel really connected to. And I also want to encourage you to feel like you can write any of the California reporters as often as you like. We really relish hearing from people in the communities that we're writing about, because we're not just writing about you, we're writing for you and to you. And this really should be a collaboration. So with that, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you guys a lot. Take care.